Good morning to those of you here in the auditorium and everyone joining us online. Welcome to the second plenary of this, the 31st annual North American CF Conference. The plenary yesterday was amazing. Hearing from Mike and Phil about the incredible advances has us all excited about the future that we are creating together. In today's plenary, our focus will turn to the here and now, the reality of CF today especially for those with advanced disease. When considering CF today, we must acknowledge the multidisciplinary care teams at care centers across the country and around the world. Their importance cannot be overstated. CF centers are where people and their families come together with the care teams to manage the disease. Beyond the technical delivery of specialized CF care, relationships are forged. And over time, they evolve into meaningful relationships between the person with CF, their family, and the care team. I'm sure many of you in the audience have experienced joy and laughter, frustration and tears, and everything in between through the relationships you've formed with your patients and families. Knowing the central importance of all that happens at care centers, it's my honor to announce this year's Quality Care Awardees. They were selected by their peers at the Center Committee from among the 80 programs that underwent a site visit in the past year. This year's Quality Care Awards go to the following centers. Please hold your applause to the end. Arkansas Children's Hospital, Baylor College of Medicine, Bristol Myers Squibb Children's Hospital at Robert Wood Johnson University, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, Children's of Minnesota, Dell Children's Medical Center of Central Texas, Intermountain Cystic Fibrosis Center, University of Utah, go Utes, <laughs> New York Medical College at Westchester Medical Center, Northwest Ohio Cystic Fibrosis Center, SUNY Upstate Medical University, Toledo Children's Hospital, University of Kansas Medical Center, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, University of Texas Health Science Center, San Antonio, Yale University School of Medicine. Please join me in a round of applause. Congratulations and thank you for your outstanding work. Next, we'd like to recognize the care teams that have developed strong working relationships with their local foundation chapter to support our shared mission. The 2016 Outstanding Partnership Awards go to the following centers. Baylor College of Medicine, Blank Children's CF Center, Children's Hospital of LA, Innova Fairfax, Maine Medical Partners, Pediatric Specialty Care, Children's Hospital of Alabama, University of Alabama at Birmingham, the Cystic Fibrosis Center of Western New York, the Nemours Children's Clinic, Orlando, University of Cincinnati Medical Center and Cincinnati Children's Medical Center, University of Miami, University of Michigan Health System, University of Rochester Medical Center, Strong Memorial Hospital, Univers University of Texas Health Sciences Center, San Antonio, West Virginia University, Charleston Division. Please join me in a round of applause. We at the Foundation, both in Bethesda and at the local chapters, greatly appreciate all that you do. The final award this morning spotlights the importance of emotional wellness to the overall health and well-being of those living with CF. This award honors two amazing people whose inspiring devotion to people living with CF has made an, made an enduring difference in our community. Rich Mattingly's work with the foundation began in 78, and he served as our chief operating officer and executive vice president from 93 to 2015. Rich understood how this disease impacts the day-to-day -day lives of people with CF. His emphasis on listening and learning from the CF community helped us gain a deeper understanding of the social and emotional toll of this disease. 
Carolyn, like Rich, was also deeply concerned about people with CF and their families. In addition, she was a passionate advocate for a range of women's issues, including programs for female prisoners re-entering society. She was remarkably empathetic towards these women, given the emotional challenges they face. Sadly, we lost Carolyn in September 2014. This award pays tribute to the, their many years of service, Rich and Carolyn. The recipient of this year's award is an internationally recognized expert on mental health in CF. I first became aware, aware of her at a grant review committee. Her application scored the best among a number of highly competitive applications. That project demonstrated the feasibility of screening for depression in a busy CF clinic. The tools and resources developed during that pilot project are now widely used at care centers across the U.S. and beyond. Our award recipient was also a key leader in the development of clinical practice guidelines on mental health, an effort jointly sponsored by the European CF Society and the CF Foundation. A survey of care centers clearly showed that many did not have the resources or expertise in place to implement the guidelines. We formed a task force to develop a plan to facilitate implementation, and our award recipient accepted the invitation to serve as chair. After thoroughly reviewing the literature, analyzing what others were doing in this area, the task force submitted a compelling set of recommendations that we have adopted as our roadmap. We next ask her to lead the implementation effort. No good deed goes unpunished. We invited her to serve as the chair of a newly formed mental health advisory committee, and again, she accepted our offer. We are thrilled with the ongoing work of this committee as we are already seeing significant, a significant increase in screening for anxiety and depression, and this is just the beginning. Much of this early success tracks back to our award recipient and her colleagues on the advisory committee. Also important to note is her wonderfully warm, inclusive, and positive leadership style. Truly is an honor to announce this year's Carolyn and C. Richard Mattingly Leadership and Mental Health Care Award goes to Dr. Beth Smith, Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Pediatrics at the State University of New York in Buffalo. Beth, please come to the stage. Thank you, Beth, for all you do. And now I invite my friend and colleague, Dr. Albert Faro, to the podium to introduce this morning's distinguished speaker. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you for your mentorship this past year. Without your guidance and encouragement, I would not be here today looking out at this incredible audience the CF community coming together as one. But that's not the only reason I'm excited today. I'm also excited because for the first time ever at a North American CF conference, we have a plenary dedicated to lung transplantation. This is a topic that's dear to my heart. For over 20 years, I've had the privilege to care for children with cystic fibrosis as well as for those who've received or were in need of that special gift, a lung transplantation. Despite the exciting progress being made in CF research and care, we know that for some of in our community, those advances will be late. And their only hope for more tomorrows will be a lung transplant. 
The Cystic Fibrosis Foundation has provided me with an opportunity to build a team that is addressing the needs of people with CF and advanced lung disease, provide, making sure that no one is left behind. So how are we going to do this? Look, we know that transplant is fundamentally a different disease, yet it requires a comprehensive approach, all hands on deck, if we are to be successful. I ask that you join us in this concerted effort, and I hope that today's plenary will inspire you to do so. This current diagram shows us where we are and our current interpretation of the transplant journey for people with CF. We started by asking our community to assess the needs. We learned that people want to better understand transplantation, what the experience entails, and how to navigate this complicated process. So we've begun by providing information through events such as this plenary, Facebook Live, a transplant mini-con, and CFF.org. To assist people with CF navigate this process, we're beefing up Compass to help people access financial and support services related to lung transplant, and providing social support with CF Peer Connect, a one-on-one -on -one mentoring program for people 16 and older. We are addressing the organ shortage by partnering with UNOS, as well as supporting research in ex vivo lung perfusion to salvage donor organs that were not originally fit to be transplanted. To inform research to better elucidate the mechanisms of chronic lung allograft dysfunction, or CLAD, a major contributor to post-transplant mortality, we are establishing a biorepository of samples from transplant recipients to allow for translational research into CLAD and in parallel augmenting the CF patient registry to allow for the collection of more granular detail on lung transplant recipients. We've convened 10 high-performing CF lung transplant centers as part of a national consortium to participate in translational studies. This work includes the funding and facilitation of the development of guidelines and best practices to optimize clinical care for people with advanced lung disease. This includes lung transplantation, palliative care, and the referral process between CF centers and transplant centers. And no matter where they are on their transplant journey, we stand ready to advocate for people with CF, working with government agencies to amplify our collective voice. Leading us in this effort is Dr. Joe Paluski. Joe has spent more than 20 years caring for people with CF. He's co-director of the CF Center, as well as until recently was the medical director of the lung transplant program, both at the University of Pittsburgh, where he's associate professor of medicine, cell biology, and pediatrics. He's currently the associate chief of clinical affairs for his division. He's held leadership roles within the Therapeutic uh, Development Network, serving as chair of the steering committee in 2015. He's also been a quality improvement coach, and he's the ideal teacher. In fact, I know that many of his excellent trainees are out in the audience today. But there's so much more to Joe. He's highly respected by patients and colleagues alike, not only for his academic achievements, but for his integrity, compassion, and kindness. He's approachable and passionate. He is willing to help anyone with anything and always puts the needs of patients and people in general in front of anything else on his rather extensive task list. I'm told that he can often be found at the end of clinic to be the one cleaning the coffee pot. He lives to serve, the consummate leader. We are thrilled to have Joe with us today to present our second plenary, Lung Transplantation, Challenges and Opportunities for Advanced CF Lung Disease. Please join me in giving Joe a warm welcome. Thank you, Al. Al, that was far too kind. I didn't pay you yet, but I will buy you a drink later. I must say this is a tremendous honor, and I, and I want to offer my good mornings to all of you and welcome those of you who are joining us online by the internet. For those of you in attendance today, what I hope to do 
This topic is tackle a very difficult topic, one that we struggle with in our care teams on a day-to-day basis. What we'll have is some special guests who will join us remotely, and together we'll take approximately 45 minutes to highlight the crucial challenges and opportunities for individuals with CF and advanced lung disease. I have no disclosures related to this presentation and only these relationships. Over the last three decades, the community of CF patients and investigators and families, with support of the CF Foundation, the NIH, and industry sponsors, has made great progress improving lung function for individuals with CF. Data shown here from the patient registry demonstrates this well. From 1990, here on the left, to 2015, on the right, note that the percentage of 18-year-old individuals with CF and an FEV1 of greater than 70% predicted increases from approximately a third to almost 75%. Importantly, the percentage of patients with advanced lung disease, an FEV1 of less than 40% predicted in purple, decreases from a quarter down to approximately 10%. This is terrific news and indicates the, the products of a number of different efforts by the CF Foundation in newborn screening, the implementation and adherence to care center guidelines, to quality improvement initiatives led by Bruce Marshall and his team, to newer pulmonary therapies developed in the 1990s and early 2000s, and improved nutritional support. This is clearly good news. Unfortunately, we face the reality that CF lung disease is progressive. This data from the registry shows median FEV1% predicted on the left over various time periods in the lifespan of an individual with CF. We see excellent preservation of lung function in the early years up to roughly age 10. And then a slowly progressive decline in median percent predicted FEV1 until patients reach their early 30s. In addition, If we consider lung function in categories of mild with FEV1 greater than equal to 70% predicted, moderate 40 to 70% predicted in gold, and severe at less than 40% predicted, we see that as patients move from the teens into the 20s and early 30s, an increase in this population of patients who have moderate to severe and severe disease. As a CF community, This increasing population of adults with advanced disease provides opportunities to improve care that addresses their specific needs. And as Al indicated, this will require a comprehensive approach impacting the work of most of you in the audience. As CF lung disease progresses, we face new challenges, and these are opportunities for us to improve the quality and survival of patients with advanced disease. We have increasingly appreciated the complications of these individuals, and I'll I'll just highlight a few of them. First, as lung disease progresses, we see deconditioning and reduced airway clearance. This is a problem that requires extra effort, and we find from our own experience and from the experience in other advanced lung diseases that pulmonary rehabilitation can very much improve conditioning and augment airway clearance. Patients with advanced disease have more severe exacerbations. And we use antibiotics to try and improve those, and we have opportunities to define the duration and optimal use of antibiotics to limit exacerbations and prevent new ones. Several new antibiotics for common CF pathogens have been developed in recent years, and research to develop new antibiotics will continue in the coming years. Corticosteroids may have some role, and we hope to see some evidence that will help define that in the next few years. Hypoxemia, that is low oxygen saturation, occurs as disease progresses. It can be subtle early on and requires screening with exercise oximetry and nocturnal nocturnal monitoring as well, so that we can detect the, the subtle hypoxemia that exercise limitation and also disrupts sleep. 
By identifying this, we can prescribe oxygen and help patients overcome the stigma of wearing supplemental oxygen and thereby preventing further complications. Pulmonary hypertension develops as lung disease progresses. Oxygen may help reduce its progression, and we have opportunities to use vasodilators like sildenafil, again to control this complication and minimize its progression. Hypercapnia, that is an elevation in blood carbon dioxide, may be asymptomatic when mild. Oxygen, this, this, however, improves sometimes with non-invasive ventilation. And one of the things that we need to learn as a network of adult providers is how best to screen for hypercapnia and define whether early intervention with non-invasive ventilation will be helpful. The final stage of lung disease is respiratory failure. We spend our careers trying to prevent this complication, but it regrettably does occur. This complication may require invasive ventilation for short-term survival and leave us with lung transplant as the only option for longer-term survival and improved quality of life. Lung transplant, as most of you know, is a relatively new intervention, but has become a more attractive option as the field of transplantation has evolved. The first lung transplants were done rarely and as an experimental therapy in the early 1960s through the early 1980s. This was an undesirable intervention with a one-year survival of less than 50%. However, that work continued, in the, and in the early days of transplant, CF was considered a contraindication to transplant. Joel Cooper and colleagues overcame that, that impression and offered the first transplant for CF in the mid-1980s in Toronto. Since then, the number of transplants captured in a registry maintained at the International Society of Heart Lung Transplant reveals a dramatic increase in the number of transplants worldwide. We see an increase in these numbers from less than 100 in the late 1980s to now over 4,000 in the 2015 registry data. Over half of these transplants are done in the United States. Well, what about for cystic fibrosis? In the last decade, 10 to 15 percent of transplants have been performed for individuals with CF, and increasing numbers of individuals with advanced disease. The number of transplants for adults with CF is likely to increase further. We look in the registry data, that number has gone from the mid to late, from the, in the mid to late 1980s, from a, a dozen or less to now 265 lung transplants recorded in the U.S. registry in 2016. Thankfully, due to improvements in care, transplant for individuals under the age of 18, shown here in white, is very rarely necessary now, and almost all transplants occur during adulthood. As we begin to think about transplant as a treatment for advanced disease, it is worth considering survival. Shown here is a Kaplan-Meier analysis looking at survival on the y-axis and time in years on the x-axis for a variety of different lung diseases. This data from the International Society and experience at transplant centers in the US, Canada, Europe, and Australia reveal that survival is highly variable. From a few days when things go poorly to greater than 20 years for individuals who have a good outcome. If we look at the cohort of patients transplanted between 1990 and 2015, we see that the greatest risk of mortality is here in the first one to two years, with one year survival of approximately 85%. Notably, comparison of the most common indications for transplant reveal that median survival, that is the point at which 50% of the patients have died, ranges from a low of 4.9 years for individuals with pulmonary fibrosis to a high of 9.2 years for individuals with CF. While these outcomes are suboptimal, when we consider that in the last decade, the anticipated survival at time of transplant for individuals with CF and advanced lung disease is typically a few years or less, a median survival of greater than nine years provides opportunity for longer survival and improved quality of life for the majority of patients. 
Having introduced transplant, let's now examine the parts of the transplant journey for patients with advanced lung disease. I like to simplify this process into four phases. Ideally, this journey occurs over months to years, occasionally over a very rushed period of a few weeks. It begins with referral to a transplant center, followed by evaluation at the transplant center, to placement on the list of lung transplant candidates seeking donor organs, to the transplant procedure. Before we discuss this journey from a provider's perspective, please meet Mindy as she shares part of her transplant journey. Please roll the video. I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis when I was born and I had a double lung transplant in January of 2010. I live in Raleigh, North Carolina and I live with my husband Mike and my daughter Abby. The first conversation I had with my care team about transplant was when I first moved to Raleigh. I had not established care yet at UNC but I was so sick, I became septic with sepatia. So I was admitted immediately. During that stay, they were really concerned because my FEV1 was probably only 37%, but they really did not have all of my records. They needed some time to get to know me as an individual before we had the second conversation. And when we did, I had been sick again. Then I think they realized that it probably was not going to bounce back. Thinking about transplant for me especially was scary just because I knew that it's not a success for everyone. You really do start to think about like your family and um, if you're gonna see your daughter grow up and be with your husband and all of those things. The whole CF care team worked hard to find a facility for me. I was, I was humbled and impressed. I was evaluated in November of 2009 at UPMC. There were probably 25 people that all came to the evaluation. It just wasn't me who was going to be taking care of myself. I had basically a community of people that were there for us and um, were going to see us through. Around mid-November before Thanksgiving, I was made active on the transplant list. I feel like it's important to evaluate each patient individually because you don't see everything that they are on a piece of paper. You don't see their support system, their drive, their uh, diligence to do everything it takes to survive. Thanks to Mindy for sharing that wonderful story. The first part of this referral process is the discussion of advanced lung disease that requires effort by the CF team. The second phase is the decision to pursue transplant that is a mutual decision made primarily by the patient and family. The last phase of the referral process is referral to a transplant center with communication between the CF team and patient and family. Perhaps the hardest part of this journey is the advanced disease discussion. I think you will all agree that at least in the United States, we see death as something that can be delayed almost indefinitely or forever. However, we all know that death is inevitable, and our challenge as healthcare providers is to see discussion of death for individuals with life-threatening disease as critically important. A recent NPR story about Charity Tilleman Dick an opera singer and lung transplant recipient articulated a patient's perspective brilliantly. She writes, one of the responsibilities of doctors is to help you to understand what the different paths forward look like. And to do that with delicacy and with kindness, with concern and with thoughtfulness. 
and it seems like a particularly difficult job to ask of people who've trained to keep their earthly fellow sojourners alive. She suggests that we ask, what do we want this to look like? It's a really important conversation that we each need to have with one another, with our doctors, because death happens, and delaying those conversations doesn't help anybody. These are powerful words of advice for all of us, as providers and patients and families. I suggest that as we approach our patients with CF, particularly during transitions from pediatric to adult CF care teams, and from CF care teams to transplant teams, we emphasize that outlining the goals of health care at each phase give us the opportunity to review challenges and develop plans that anticipate the likeliest scenarios. For patients with advanced disease, this includes a discussion of prognosis and death and of advanced care directives. Importantly, recognition of the course of, and treatment options for advanced disease allows incorporation of supportive and palliative care expertise that may be beyond the multidisciplinary CF team. The CF Foundation has committed significant resources to identify best practices for supportive care needs. This multi-institutional effort will help all of us to provide better services for individuals with CF and advanced lung disease. Those of us who have had discussions with patients about death and dying and aggressive treatment options like lung transplant have come to expect a variety of patient reactions. Patients like Mindy and many others have learned that discussion leads to an emotional and intellectual process that typically evolves over months to years and requires many conversations and support from families and healthcare providers. If there is a typical course, it begins with initial reactions of denial, shock, anger, fear, and or anxiety. We hope that this evolves to an acceptance that I do or do not wish to pursue the transplant option and hope that my family and care team will provide a comfortable death when time comes whether or not I pursue transplant. I'll share one example from our center now almost 10 years ago. This is Billy, five years post-transplant, enjoying one of her hobbies. Her story is, was typical of many patients and that her lung disease progressed to an FEV1 less than 30% predicted and a requirement for continuous supplemental oxygen. Our care team identified her as high risk for short-term death and initiated discussions about her disease progression and limited reserve. We introduced lung transplant as a treatment option for her. She had denial and fear for many years, but after several years of clinic visits and discussions and over five years with an FEV1 less than 30% predicted, with support of her sister and mother, Billy moved forward to transplant referral and evaluation. Early discussion provided time for her to work through her fears and anxiety. Recent work has identified opportunities for improvement for our CF care teams with the transplant discussion and referral processes. Natalie West and Christian Merlot and colleagues at the Johns Hopkins University surveyed CF centers regarding discussion and referral for transplant. Responses were received from three quarters of the CF centers, with most of the respondents being physicians or nurses. The majority of CF teams responded that they consistently provide education and assess patient understanding of lung transplant. However, when reflecting on the timing of transplant referral, the survey identified a number of significant concerns. The percentage of these are shown here, with significant occurrences of the discussion being perceived as too late, with patients being referred too late, with patients being too sick to refer, and then perhaps most importantly, the observation that the timing of referral had a negative impact. In part because of these data, the CF Lung Transplant Initiative includes a working group on referral best practices. Moreover, the CF Foundation is funding a lung transplant transition quality improvement program 
with the Dartmouth Institute for Healthcare Systems and Practice. With these efforts, we are optimistic that best practices can be defined and disseminated to the broader CF community to improve the initial stages of the lung transplant journey. In the meantime, let's review some broad concepts about lung transplant to guide our discussions with patients and families. One of our challenges is to identify individuals most likely to benefit from transplant as a treatment to prolong survival and improve quality of life. Donor lungs remain a precious resource, and the waitlist mortality of up to 20% reflects this limitation. Transplantation is not an option for all individuals with advanced lung disease. Contraindications to transplant are evidence-based, and their presence increases the risk for morbidity and mortality. In the era of Twitter and Instagram and other forms of social media, we all recognize the need for some fact-checking to dispel false facts. A number of these I have heard over the years, I'm going to share sort of my top five or six. First is that patients who require mechanical ventilation are not candidates for transplant. Second is that resistant organisms and prior chest surgery preclude lung transplant. Another, CF liver disease requires combined lung and liver transplant. Lung transplant cures CF. Patients who undergo lung transplant are unable to return to work or school, travel, or have children or pets. And lastly, survival after lung transplant is limited to nine years. I won't take the time now to dispel each of these false facts and recommend that you join Christian Merlot for a Facebook Live discussion for additional discussion of these issues. As with any surgical intervention, there is variability among programs for what constitutes an absolute contraindication to transplant. This begs the question of who is best to counsel patients regarding the transplant option. Experience at transplant centers suggests that the roles of the CF team and the transplant team are ideally complementary, with final determination of transplant candidacy made at the transplant program. For the CF team, a general discussion of life goals will help frame the discussion. The focus here is on what individuals with advanced lung disease want the future to look like. The CF team can describe transplant benefit, including survival and outcomes. They can review the phases of the transplant evaluation to give patients an understanding of what the process looks like. The CF care team can summarize the care requirements after transplant and highlight the care after transplant is different from care before transplant. And lastly, the care team can refer patients and families to a number of reliable, well-done websites, including cff.org and unos.org. At the transplant team, a number of, of factors happen and extend this. First is an assessment of the goals of transplant and commitment of the individual patient to aggressive interventions like mechanical ventilation and transplantation surgery. The CF transplant team also reviews transplant risks and benefits, but does this in much more detail than the CF team needs to do. The transplant team will identify patient-specific comorbidities and the implications of these for patient outcomes. And lastly, they will review care after transplant and go over the elements that are necessary to optimize quality of life and optimize transplant survival. A major challenge for us is the timing of referral. When should patients with advanced lung disease be referred for transplant? Ideally, we would have accurate predictive models for short-term survival, but unfortunately we know that short-term survival for individuals with severe disease is unpredictable. A number of risk factors for short-term survival have been identified. I'll take a minute to review a recent study reported by Kathy Ramos and Chris Goss, where they looked at the survival of individuals with CF and an FEV1 of less than 30% predicted during periods of clinical stability. As shown here, the median survival for this cohort was 6.6 .6 years, with a gradual decline over this 10-year period. 
This is markedly improved from the 1990s when survival for a similarly defined cohort was just over two years. These data again highlight improvements in survival with advanced disease and some of the challenges we face in predicting survival as one element of a decision of when to refer for transplant. Importantly, Kathy's study reveals that for year-to-year -year co comparisons, 10% of patients with FEV1 less than 30% predicted die per year, as shown in the white columns. In contrast, 6 to 8% of patients undergo lung transplant. While we'll need further studies to, to know whether these patients were ever referred for transplant or the nature of the conversations that were had, this highlights differences in approaches and experiences for patients. Kathy and Chris further did a, another study where they reported the transplant referral practices for patients who had a stable FEV1 of less than 30% predicted to give us an idea of what our current practices are in the United States. They performed a retrospective review of USCF registry data from 2001 to 2008. They identified a cohort of patients whose FEV1 was less than 30% predicted for two years, a population that all of us would agree is at high risk for complications, including death. They defined this group as being eligible for lung transplant evaluation based on their disease severity, and then considered were they referred for transplant. And what you see here is that 65% of this cohort was referred for transplant, while 35% were reported as not referred for transplant. This was a surprisingly high number and led to an analysis of, of factors that may have contributed to the decision to not refer for transplant. From the CF patient registry, B. sepatia infection and low socioeconomic status were identified as predictors. In a physician survey, B. sepatia, cancer, renal disease, and malnutrition were also predictive of non-referral. While these medical reasons may seem appropriate, some of them are relative contraindications and acceptable criteria for lung transplant vary among transplant programs. In brief, decisions on transplant candidacy are transplant center specific and best made by those centers. Notably, patient preference accounted for 41% of the non-referrals. One important short-term goal of ours is to improve the education and decision-making process around transplant candidacy to ensure that opportunities are not lost due to misinformation and non-referral. Potentially, decision aids being developed in Canada and elsewhere may create a consistent message and objectively allow patients and families to make decisions on whether to pursue transplant. Let's now pause and allow Jeremy to share his journey as it highlights the challenges in deciding when to discuss and refer for transplant. Please roll the video. My name is Jeremy. I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis when I was six months old. I had a lung transplant in September of 2012. My name is Joy and I'm Jeremy's wife and we've been married for 13 years. I live in Altoona, Pennsylvania. We have two children. Their names are Gavin and Joelle. Before I had my transplant, I was working full time. I have ever since I was 18. I was always doing so well that transplant just never came up in a conversation with the doctors. It was only a month, two months before my transplant that I was actually placed on oxygen. September 1st of 2012, I was life flighted to Pittsburgh. About two weeks after I was in the hospital, a nurse approached me about the transplant. From that point on, I don't really remember what happened. He was placed on a ventilator and transferred to Presbyterian, worked up for a transplant and placed on the list. I was definitely going on adrenaline. I didn't eat, I didn't sleep. Many, many phone calls, meetings. I talked to you know the social workers, many doctors. He went into full respiratory failure, um, so they had to place him on ECMO, and that you know kept him alive for a, a few days until a transplant came in. After he was listed, 29 hours later, he got a transplant. I think that in CF clinic, they should start at a young age to start to educate patients about transplant, so it's not 
a scare whenever it is time for one. With CF, you're so concerned about how you're doing at the present time because you never really looked into the future, so it never really crossed my mind to think about transplant. Now seeing, you know, how many transplants are done on a daily basis. And the um, success rate. And though. the success rates. Being educated on that, it's not so scary. And people can look as a transplant as a second lease on life because there is so much more after transplant that it's not the end. A remarkable story, I must say, in retrospect. But one of our goals is to not do that again. It, Jeremy's t experience teaches us that reliance on FEV1 and functional status are imperfect. And some patients, despite our best efforts, will suffer a precipitous decline in function and require a rush to transplant for survival. So is there a best time to refer? Consensus statements provide guidelines summarized here. Many of us have relied on FEV1 as a guide for when to think about transplant referral, with 30% predicted being the, the benchmark or a declining trajectory. Early work in our consensus group regarding referral to transplant reveals consensus that we would like to propose that FEV1 less than 40% be a more appropriate trigger to at least consider whether transplant referral is appropriate. Other factors to, include, to consider include progressive clinical decline, such as frequent exacerbations, recurrent hemoptysis or pneumothorax, supplemental oxygen need or hypercapnia, and other risk factors that we know from registry data are associated with shortened survival. Importantly, early discussion and referral provide an opportunity to address any comorbidities that increase transplant risk and ideally create a safety net, a plan B option, if you will, for when disease progresses. When in doubt, we suggest referral early. Transplant centers are not uncommonly asked to consult over telephone with these sorts of issues, and so they can be an excellent resource for physicians unclear of the plan. The transplant journey next step is evaluation. This involves insurance clearance and medical record review. Most programs will look at medical records very carefully, and the information provided is important for them to make the right initial decision of whether to invite the patient for a referral. The next phase is scheduling and evaluation. And then lastly, there's a selection committee recommendation that is conveyed to the patient, family, and healthcare team. The transplant evaluation is typically an outpatient process over three to four days. This includes consultations with all the team members to allow them to assess the suitability of transplant for that individual. Testing essentially assesses for comorbidities, cardiac, pulmonary, renal disease severity, and includes a number of tests and laboratory studies. Age-appropriate healthcare screening is required and can be done prior to the evaluation. The data from these several days is accumulated and leads to a selection committee meeting at which one of three decisions is typically rendered. One is to decline the individual for transplant because the risks are too significant and the benefit too small. Other outcomes can be defer, that is, to continue medical management and await transplant listing until the disease progresses. The third option is list, and for patients with very advanced disease, this is the, typically the outcome. If patients are declined, this provides an opportunity to seek a second opinion. If patients are deferred or list, we address comorbidities and use those comorbidities to address and reduce risk. The next phase of the process is listing. This is a mutual decision on when to be added to the transplant list. It's important to know that this is a indeed mutual decision. Patients have to want transplant to undergo it successfully. The next phase is management of advanced lung disease while waiting. This is something that care centers can do in collaboration with the transplant centers. And lastly is coping with uncertainty. Being placed on a lung transplant list adds another level of uncertainty about the future. And it provides an opportunity for us to continue supportive and palliative care in parallel with medical and transplant focused care uh, so that we provide best services for our patients and families. 
Since 2005, lung allocation has been based on disease severity with a goal to minimize death on the waiting list and optimize survival after transplant. The scoring system considers medical urgency and post-transplant outcomes to prioritize the outcome of donor lungs. Retrospective review of UNOS data has been used to identify variables that predict waitlist mortality and one-year post-transplant survival. These variables are used for a calculation that generates a lung allocation score. Variables included in this allocation score for CF are summarized here. Note that primary drivers to a high priority score for CF are oxygen requirement, partial pressure of CO2, and ventilator use. FVC, not FEV1, is one of the factors considered in the equation. Note that some factors that are appropriate for decision on transplant referral, like exacerbation frequency, pneumothorax, refractory hemoptysis, are not included as variables. Here are a few facts about the lung transplant waiting list in the U.S. Notably, individuals with CF comprise approximately 10% of the list. Waiting times in general have improved with the lung allocation score, with median time to transplant measured in months. With the range, however, of several hours or days to several years. Disappointingly, the waitlist mortality remains significant. And for individuals with CF, the mortality in the U.S. has been 15 to almost 18 per 100 waitlist years since 2011. For this reason, one of our CF lung transplant consortium working groups is addressing how we can improve the organ allocation process to reduce this waitlist mortality. Not uncommonly, patients progress while waiting on the transplant list. Some develop respiratory failure, and at this point, options are mechanical ventilation, either non-invasive via mask or invasive via an endotracheal tube. In many circumstances, early tracheostomy and mobilization may be useful to buy additional time on the waiting list. Unfortunately, some patients cannot be adequately supported by mechanical ventilation and require extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, or ECMO, as a bridge to transplant or in unusual circumstances to recovery. The newest permutation of ECMO consists of a single catheter placed in the central veins where blood can be removed and run through a a membrane oxygenator to provide oxygen and eliminate CO2 prior to being returned to the heart and lungs. An advantage of this device is that some patients can be removed from ventilator support, allowing for mobilization and airway clearance. This is our friend Billy, who we met earlier. Prior to transplant, Billy was on ECMO, and this device allowed her to be awake and interactive, to participate in social media on her mobile device for three weeks as she waited for a suitable lung donor. The last phase of the transplant journey is surgery and recovery, and then the challenges of of aftercare. I am not a surgeon, so I will tread very lightly on the details of transplant surgery, but I will say that the standard procedure is a bilateral anastomosis via clamshell incision shown here. For many individuals with CF, the most difficult part of the operation in the surgeon is removal of the native lungs that are oftentimes scarred and stuck to the chest wall. Once the lungs are removed, there are three connections between the patient and the new lungs, shown here. This looks simple, but it's typically a six to eight hour procedure, indicating its complexity. There are a number of advances in the surgical aspects of transplant, most notably ex vivo lung perfusion, shown here. This technology allows the lungs to be ventilated. Here you see the lungs expanding and contracting and perfused to support the lung for several hours outside the body. This allows for an assessment of lung function, shown here is one of our surgeons looking at the airways and inspecting to identify their suitability for transplant. More interestingly, preliminary data indicates that this technology can safely increase the pool of donor organs. And looking forward, this data allows the opportunity, as is being spearheaded by the Toronto Transplant Program, to to allow us to rehabilitate or to treat donor lungs to improve short-term function 
and potentially reduce longer-term complications. The post-transplant course can best be considered in time periods and potential complications. For simplicity, we consider post-operative recovery as the days to weeks and rarely months before hospital discharge. The early post-transplant months often bring medication adjustments and continued functional improvement. This is followed by an intermediate period of one to five years when care requirements remain quite intensive, and then a longer term beyond five years when care for many becomes quite simple and routine. The risks of complications varies over time, with graft failure being an early risk, followed by a risk of infection related to pre-transplant pathogens and immunosuppression. Acute cellular rejection is common but usually responds to therapy. Antibody-mediated rejection is a recently recognized complication of transplantation and provides new opportunities for intervention to maintain graft function. As patients live longer after transplant, there's an increasing risk of renal failure and malignancy, including lymphomas, skin cancers, and GI malignancies, so screening for these complications remains important. Chronic rejection causes scarring of the airways and an obstructive lung disease that has some similarities physiologically to CF lung disease. The mechanisms for this are still being defined but suffice it to say that this is the holy grail of lung transplant, as it is the major cause of late transplant mortality. With improving knowledge of transplant complications, the lung transplant community is making progress toward improving survival for individuals with CF. This data, again from the International Registry, shows survival curves for transplant recipients with CF in, during progressive eras, from an early period of 1990 to 1998 to two more recent eras. Note that survival is improving, with five-year survival from just over 50% to approximately 65% in the recent era. Ten-year survival now approaches 50%. Most of this progress has occurred early, with reduction in surgical complications and, and early uh, mor morbidity. Better recognition of these early phase events and, and their prevention, as well as addressing chronic rejection, are critical to improving these outcomes serve further. Let's now say a few words about life after transplant. What does the care look like? Improvements have contributed to improve survival, and our focus has to be prevention and early identification of complications. Novel immunosuppressive agents are being developed for other organ transplants and will provide opportunity for lung recipients. Prevention of infections, in part through an understanding of the airway microbiome after transplant, will remain an area for investigation. Experience has taught us that coordination of care between the CF team and transplant team varies widely, and regular communication is important to optimizing care. The transplant team typically manages pulmonary and immunosuppressive care, while, while the CF team can continue to optimally manage CF co complications and provide emotional and psychological support throughout the lifespan. One of the goals of our CF transplant consortium is to identify best practices for post-transplant care, as this has never been done. To do this, we'll use the techniques that Bruce Marshall and, and others have, have used so well for CF lung disease and nutritional problems, that is benchmarking, existing literature, and expert opinion to improve post-transplant care and outcomes. We've talked a lot about the referral process. What else do I see in the vision for our future? First is an increase in organ availability and allocation to prevent death on a waiting list. Second is that we need to understand the mechanisms of rejection and identify methods to detect both rejection and infection early. Lastly, we need methods to, to prevent and allow all lung transplant recipients to enjoy a normal lifespan. This will require conquering chronic rejection. Al nicely introduced the CF Foundation Lung Transplant Initiative. And together, we've tried to emphasize that improving the lung transplant journey 
will require a multi-pronged approach that addresses each of the areas that impact that transplant experience. We know that the CF Foundation goes all in for its initiatives. And with their support, we will address each of these areas to improve the transplant journey. Before we hear again from Mindy and Jeremy and meeting a few of the transplant recipients who generously shared glimpses of their lives after transplant, I would like to thank a few of the many people who are supporting our efforts in advanced disease and lung transplant. The foundation leadership has been critical for this and making an investment and providing resources for us to begin the work that we need to accomplish. I would personally like to thank the courageous and heroic individuals with CF and their families, like Mitch and Gail Greenberg, Mindy and Jeremy, who have given me the privilege and honor to share challenges, celebrate successes, and cope with losses. You allow all of us, as healthcare providers, to partner on your journey and work as a team with the singular goal of improving the lives of individuals with cystic fibrosis. You and those whose transplant journeys have ended are pioneers, and your battles and sacrifices have helped us move forward with better options for individuals with advanced lung disease. Your drive and your passion for life are humbling and inspiring and motivate the, this important work as we try to learn and do better as a CF community. Together, we will make progress. Please roll the video. The first time that I was able to breathe on my own after transplant, I was elated, excited, and it was like I was 20 again, probably, let's say maybe 17, because that was the last time I was at 100% oxygen. Um, it was amazing, and I couldn't stop looking at the monitor <laughs> because I couldn't believe it was real. I told him, actually, that he got new lungs, and he started crying. And she said, you made it. You got a transplant. And... Of course, I tried to talk, and I, <laughs> I had a trach in, and I couldn't talk at all. That was amazing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was classified as a quadriplegic. I had to go through therapy to learn how to walk again, talk, pretty much do everything as if you were a baby, and it, it was definitely hard. It was definitely a miracle, and he was challenged to do it, and he worked hard every day at therapy. Organ donation for me has changed my life, changed my entire life. It's let me be with my husband, it's let me see my daughter grow up. I feel really lucky. Pretty much every one of my friends, if you talk to them, would say I live every day to the fullest and um, I enjoy it. <laughs> I try to enjoy it. I have my whole life ahead of me now, and it's totally different living with new lungs, not being held back. We had another child, and that's something that I never would have thought would have happened years ago, and that is definitely a, a great thing. <laughs>